I'm Logan Crawford, and right now on Spotlight, we're speaking with Jesse Tafel. He is an exciting new voice in the realm of adventure literature. He is inviting readers into a whirlwind of treachery, magic, and unknown territories in endless treasure, book one of the Songs of the Chorus. We're delighted to have Jesse in the spotlight today. We thank the folks at Atticus Publishing for helping us put him in the spotlight today. And we ask viewers like you to support writers like him by subscribing to our channel. Jesse, thanks so much for joining me here today on Spotlight. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. This is quite a tale you have spun. Had this been cooking in your brain for years before you put it down on paper? Yes, I've had um, a lot of trouble sleeping at night. I, I must have some kind of insomnia or something. Mm -hmm. And one way I know is to help myself go to sleep better is always to come up with stories, to try and put myself to sleep, like almost like a bedtime story even for like adults. And I would just come up with crazy, fantastical ideas and then go to sleep, have crazy dreams, and then immediately wake up and write them down. Everything that I had fresh, write them down. Awesome. So this yeah. is very much inspired by storytelling to yourself when you're going to sleep mm -hmm. and then kind of like a lucid dream. Lucid dreams. Sleeping. Yes, yes. And then taking notes. So you have the notepad right by your bed or something when you wake yep, up in the morning? Absolutely, yes. Yeah, because it's funny. Sometimes you'll dream something so wild. You're like, no way will I ever forget this. Right. And then two minutes later, it's like, uh, what did I dream about last night? You know? So, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I love the character of Prince Maxwell. Let's give the folks at home an overview of what your book is all about. Sure, absolutely. So the story is about a teenage prince in a fictional world that I've come up with. And uh, he finds himself one day, he's shipwrecked on an island, and it's a weird island. There's talking trees, there's mermaids, there's gorillas, there's pirates, everything is alive on this island. And uh, Max, the prince, he's a spoiled uh, recluse. He's afraid of the world. He has a limited cynical view of the world living in a, a privileged castle. And uh, now he's thrust into an adventure or a quest, and it's uh, not of his choice. But he must learn to adapt and grow and... He uh, has to see the bigger picture of the world. It doesn't resolve, revolve around him, and he has to learn that. And in a way, he becomes the hero, the protector of the nature of the island from these pirates that have come to the island. Uh, on the island, he meets uh, a native boy there. His name is Edison, and he's his polar opposite. He's, he's carefree, he's kind, he's strong, he's tough. He's your Huck Huckleberry Finn. Right. He's yeah. he's the opposite. Max is scrawny. He's a little weak, but he's super, super intelligent. So they foil one another. So they have to learn to work together, become friends to defeat these pirates that have come to the island. They've come to they come to find this treasure that's there. They're blasting holes in uh, the, the mountains. They're uprooting trees. They're hurting the innocents there. And uh, there's a, so they're looking for this treasure that is cursed. The box, when it's emptied, it will refill itself. So the pirates are after it. And along the way, they meet a colorful cast of characters that uh, Max will learn eventually that aren't as you first perceive them. The criminals, they might have a sad backstory that you're not aware of. And the heroes, they might be liars at the end of the day. All things that we learn, you know, growing up and maturing. And it's a perfect time when you're 13 to start learning these things. Yeah. Another intriguing character you developed is Marinus the Waterbender. Tell yes. the folks at home about him. He was a character that I invented to be. Um, he was originally the main character. He is a character that he's the he's your Gandalf. He's your Obi-Wan Kenobi. He controls water. He controls the ocean. He's wise. He's hundreds of years old. Full of mystery, though. He's complete mystery. You don't know much about him other than he loves the adventure. And um, he is their sage of the group. He teaches them things and then he'll disappear and they don't know where he went. So originally he was my main character when I was writing these nautical tales, these adventures and stuff. And I thought it better to have someone you could relate to as the main character. That's when I came up with Max. I came up with him because he's the complete opposite of all of that. So he's a fish. Out, he's literally a fish out of water and he's going to learn from Marinus. I had to switch the characters around. Awesome. And the island itself, Boyang, is yeah. kind of a character. It has senses. It has feelings. Tell exactly. us about that. 
Yeah, so the island, I wanted to take it to the extreme of when people say that, like, the trees are alive, the wind's alive, and this it literally is. They're alive, they hurt, they feel, they feel pain, they feel uh, happiness, and it's um, something that I gained from reading a ton of mythology, studying mythology in school, and a lot of, a lot of Japanese mythology, Shintoism, a lot of things where we need to respect the nature as equal to humans because at any time a tsunami can come through the full or a forest fire. And so in the story, when the island is hurt, it fights back, mm. but it can't always protect itself. So that's where these heroes, our heroes of the stories come in and they finish the job that the island can't in defending itself. And our heroes face danger and threats from Captain Anne Bell and her band yeah. of pirates. Tell us about developing her as a character and the pirates as well. Yes, she was something um, I wanted to, to create the craziest person you can think of, something that's completely um, unpredictable. She's unpredictable. She's scary to them. They're, they're kids. She's an adult. And they never know what she's going to do next. And I wanted to create that fear with them with a little bit of humor because it's not a complete serious story. There's humor there. And um, yeah, and then as you fur the further you go in the story, you learn about her intentions, what she's all about, that she's more than she seemed, like I said earlier. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, this is such a wonderful world you have created very unique, very different. I find it difficult to even compare it to another work of literature. Have you thought about transforming this into a series or a, or a movie perhaps? So yes, this, um, it took me four years to publish this first one solely because I was mapping out the next uh, six or seven that I have planned. So I wanted to definitely make it a series um, sort of in the vein of J.K. Rowling's Harry Potter. I was going to start innocent, start fun. And then as they go along, they get a little, little darker and a little like more serious because they're going to grow up by the end and they're going to become adults. Yeah. And um, this will be those bright, early, fun adventure beginnings. And then until they get a little more serious. Absolutely. We're talking about book one right now. Yes. How many books do you envision in the series? Either six, seven or eight I have planned. Oh, and what, what book are you on right now? I am almost on the second one right now. I'm hoping to have it finished by the end of the year. Awesome. Awesome. Who is your reader? Who, when you write this stuff down, do you say, hey, take a look at this? My reader, I try to, it's mainly for the middle school crowd, definitely, because it's not too childish that they would say, oh, this is for babies. I want to add a All little right. bit of flair in there. Um but definitely for anybody who loves fantasy, anybody who loves pirates, I wanted to meld the pirate and the fantasy world together into something different, something new, creative. And um, so, yeah, if anybody, even sci-fi people would love it. Yeah. Anybody who loves any type of fantasy, it's a fun, easy, light read. Exactly, exactly. And what I was actually getting at, though, is there a person, once you've written your book or written a chapter, that you actually physically give it to oh, and say, yes, hey, what do yeah, you think um, of this? So Yes, ex yeah, I had my, so I dedicated the book to my grandmother because she went out of her way asking for chapter to chapter. So she went, mm -hmm. no, I want to know, I want to read it. I want to read it before anybody else does. So in the beginning of the book, I wrote, this is for my first fan, uh, Graham. So she was my first. And then there was a girl that I work with and a heavy, heavy reader. We would always talk about books. So one day I said, you know, I'm writing a book. And she said, oh, I want to read it before it becomes published. So I gave it to her and we share the same birthday too. So we have an mm. inside joke with that too. So I made her, Nicole, she read it first. And then finally, my dad, who was a history teacher. Um, so he's very learned. He was the one that made us become readers, me and my siblings and I. And um, he has a whole library in his house. So I said, here, I want you to read this, but I don't want you to enjoy it. I want you to edit it. I want you to make sure you cross out Tell me what, what is bad, what is good, does this work, does this character not work? So he helped me immensely with that. He was a huge help to me with that, having the teacher on on hand, on call. Awesome, awesome. What do you do when you're not writing these wonderful adventures? I am currently a bartender right now. Okay. Yeah. I think you're going to get a lot of stories from people for other types of literature as you go along, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. I'm working on a sort of autobiographical book of short stories 
of, um, and this one wouldn't be for kids, but um, just some of the zany, insane, funny things that I encounter in my life as a bartender, because almost every weekend there's a story to tell. And that's one of those things where it's like, well, got to write this down. This just happened. So I want to work on something like that. And uh, and then something else, uh, I've been dabbling with a horror anthology as well, trying to put my foot in every every pool, try to make everyone uh, happy. Sounds great. Sounds great. Well, you're going to make a lot of people happy with these books. And I think your bartender script could actually be a screenplay. Right. Because right. I think that'd be an awesome setting for a, a, a movie of like eccentric people coming to the bars and all the happenings and that transpire even within 24 hours, I'm sure. It's Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Awesome. Well, the name of the book is Endless Treasure Book One the songs of the chorus. What do you mean by that? The songs of the chorus. So chorus is the um, country that they live in. So that it's the kingdom of chorus. And mm. uh, a lot of the story, a big aspect is uh, music. Music plays into the fantasy aspect of it. Our character Edison that's on the island, he can hear music as sort of a, a telepathy. The music um, guides him when he walks into a room. So I, I felt sort of like, when you're watching a film and the scary moments happening, the music begins to be scary before what's on the screen is, ha is scary. And that's how he feels. He has an internal music in him that, oh, danger is near. Or, oh, I met this person and I have a great, you know, there's a great song in my head right now. So I, I think I can trust this person. So it's an aspect of certain characters where music it plays a huge role in the uh, story. It's a very, it's like a subtext that I have going on. So the kingdom's called the chorus. The, the people with powers in this world, they can channel their energy via music sort of thing. I, I came up with something like that. Wonderful. I love how you yeah. write to the senses. It really yeah. grips you and grabs you deep into the book because you're seeing it, you're feeling it, you're hearing it. And I think yeah. that's just terrific. Jesse, thank you so much for joining us here today on Spotlight. Thank you, Ms. Crawford. Have a great one. Same to you, sir. And to the folks at home, I'm Logan Crawford, thanking you for your time this time. Until next time on Spotlight.